we as a church do every January and every August, we partner with the Church of the Highlands for 21 days of prayer. Now, in January, it's supposed to be prayer and fasting, but if you'd like to fast during August, you're more than welcome to. And we started last Sunday, and today is day eight. And what the focus is in the fall is actually praying for those who are, are lost. And so, um, and, and, and also for just the Lord God to allow us as his children to be harvest workers in the harvest field. You know, scripture tells us, you know, Jesus didn't seem to be so concerned about the lost rejecting him as much as he was about the believers not going. And so he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out harvest workers. And that is who we are supposed to be. There are people all across the country who are praying for their loved ones. And there are those loved ones that are here in Hardy County. And we are supposed to be the answer to their prayers. And the question is, is will we? And so I, I want us to, to pray um, specifically this morning as I pray I'm going to be praying for our school system. Obviously, school started on Thursday here in Hardy County. And uh, with our guests that we had last week, I didn't have really an opportunity to go into that. So I'm going to pray. My, our focus time of prayer this morning is going to be on, the, on our school system and our teachers and our students and for the Holy Spirit to do a revival type work among those believers in the, in the schools and among those teachers to where then they actually live out their faith and that there can be an awakening among the student body. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on that during my time of prayer, even right now. But let us, as, and as I'm praying, you be praying there in your pew, praying for those that you know specifically, personally, that are lost. There, every one of us know lost individuals. Begin praying that the Holy Spirit would convict them of the scriptures they've heard. Pray that as the Lord of the harvest, they would say that God would send harvest workers into their lives, that they might hear the truth of the gospel. Let us be intentional about our prayer focus for the lost and our personal involvement in the process of sharing the gospel with them. So let's, let's take this time. You be praying, I'm going to be praying, and in a few moments we'll enter into our, our Bible study, our Sunday morning sermon. So Father, we do exalt you. Every song that we've just been singing has been declaring your goodness and your grace, your favor and your love. These songs have been pointing to your just your your perfect pleasure of giving us your son Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary to shedding his blood for our sins that we might be born again that we might be saved from the depravity of our lives that we were all born se separated from you and heading to an eternal destination of the lake of fire but by your grace by your mercy by your love you said that while we were yet enemies of the cross, you said, I will send my son and let him bear the price that they cannot pay, that they might have a relationship with me. And Father, I am so grateful for the relationship that you do give to us. I am so grateful for the life in Christ that we get to live a life no longer directed and guided by our own pursuits and our own passions, but we get to live a life that is, is surrendered to your lordship that what you say, we say, yes, Lord, we will walk in obedience. We will walk favorably with you. And Father, not by our strength, not by our might, not by our ability, not by our intellect, but by Christ who dwells within us. Father, thank you that you did not abandon us, but that you really did send your Holy Spirit to seal us for the day of our redemption. That you as the author and perfecter of our faith redeemed us, that we might know you, experience you, and one day enter into your presence, perfectly glorified with you. Father, thank you for that. And Lord, it is out of that reality. It is out of this reality that we do pray for those who are far from you, for those that have not come to that saving relationship with you. Father, this morning, we want to specifically focus in on our school system. Father, we have teachers, we have administrators, we have um, service personnel, we have all kinds of people within our school system, ranging everywhere from the, from the bus to the actual classroom. Father, all in between. And we have interaction with these thousands of kids here in Hardy County every single day. And Father, we have many, many believers who sit in these positions um, of, of teachers and faculty, and we have many students who also are yours. And Lord, I pray that you would send a revival among those who are yours, even at this moment. Father, that you'd stir their heart to where they are just abiding in you. That, they, that this whole concept of lordship would be real to their very lives. 
and that they would live broken and surrendered lives before you. Lives that no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but lives that are being transformed by the renewing of their mind as they spend time in your scripture, as they spend time in the collective body of believers worshiping you, as they spend time just crying out in prayer and intercession for these, these schoolmates that they have. Father, I pray that you would send a mighty awakening among the lost students here of Hardy County. Father, I pray for the different organizations um, like the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and the, and the Gear Up and, and, um, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Salt Ministry there in the high school as well. Father, I pray for each of those student-led organizations. And I pray that it wouldn't just be just a, a oh, we had a nice little Bible study, but that it would be transformative in nature. That it, would, that it would, again, go beyond just these meetings that would enter into these classrooms. And that when the world system and the propaganda of the lies of the adversary begin to, to be poured out upon our students, that there would be a rising up that says, we will stand for truth and truth alone. And that Christ Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And anything that is in contradiction to him is a lie from the pit of hell. So, Father, I pray that you'd raise up these kind of students, that they would be indeed salt and light in the midst of this school system, and that they would declare resolutely and unequivocally that Jesus is Lord of their lives. And as a result, again, that the seeds would be planted, that the scattering of the seeds would take place, and that souls would be saved. And so, Father, we are asking you as the Lord of the harvest to send these students, these teachers, these faculty, these administrators, these personnel within the school system, send them into the harvest field. And Father, I also pray that we here at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green, that we would have that same kind of heartbeat, that we would also, in our goings and our comings, that wherever we may go, whether, the, whether at work or whether with our neighbor or whether with our family or whether in the supermarket or whether in the, on the golf course or on the boat, Father, wherever you send us, may we be ready in season and out of season, season to be able to give the defense for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus and that we would be ready at any moment's notice to say, you know, I, I understand what you're going through. I, I, I've been there and I have found one who has walked with me through it all. Jesus, my Savior, my Lord, my God, my King, my brother, one who I am co-heir with for all of eternity. And so, Father, I pray that kind of work to be done within our church and within our own lives. Father, be glorified. Be glorified. And Lord, now, even at this moment, as we begin to turn our attentions to your scriptures, I pray that even as we look at this particular passage out of Matthew, that you would grip our heart, that your Holy Spirit would be the one to teach us even right now, that we might experience more of the fullness of your love and your compassion, and that we would again more understand this concept of lordship, that you are Lord, and what that actually means. We must learn how to walk with you, abide with you. And may we see that even in today's passage. Father, thank you for this gathering. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can begin turning to Matthew chapter 7. And if you do not have a Bible, you can reach forward into that pew back in front of you. Turn to the New Testament, which is the right-hand side of the Bible, to page number 5. And that is where we're going to be. And if you do not have a Bible, we would love for you to take that Bible with you as a gift from us. Because we want everybody reading the Word of God and spending time in the Word of God. And so as you are turning there to Matthew chapter 5, let me make some preliminary, Matthew chapter 7 on page 5, let me make some preliminary statements here. Um, as, as, as I looked and I, I was praying, obviously we, we were in a sermon series as a church, the book of Ephesians, but I, we took the summer off. And we will, uh, when I come back, the last Sunday in August, we will resume our Ephesians study and taking it on into the fall. Um, but we've been taking the, the, this time off this summer and just doing these kind of one-off sermons. And as I was praying and saying, Lord God, what is it that we need to close the summer with? The Holy Spirit just kept bringing this to my heart, bringing this to my mind, this whole concept of Lord. The sermon title is, Why Do You Call Me Lord, Lord? Now that's actually out of the book of Luke, and I'll reference that here in a moment. But why do you call me Lord, Lord? Now the way the passage in Luke continues, it says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you to do, 
or command you to do? That's a powerful question. Because if he's Lord, our response needs to be, yes, Lord. Even when we don't want to do it, you know? And, and so we're going to be talking about that. And, and, and I'll tell you, the, the one that, the, where most of this came from is it's not me. My, my favorite preacher, if you don't know, is Alistair Begg. I love Alistair. Alistair and I, I he, we're just real tight. We, he, he would see me and he would go, oh, that, there's Scott. Mike laughed at that. Mike laughed at that. And you said you're in the, okay, so I don't know Alistair, but I sure would like to know Alistair. He's, he, I, I really do. I love his preaching. And, and he actually preached a sermon out of here. And I'm going to quote him a good bit sometime this morning. Uh, there's a section of, of what he said that, and one of our points that I'm like, oh my goodness, this is, I can't say it better than Alistair can. I, and I, I wish I could say it like Alistair could. I mean, that guy could read a cereal box and I'd be enamored with it. Um, he's, he's from Scotland and that, that, that Scottish accent that he write, uh, that he, that he, you know, he talks with, it's just like rivets you right there in. And like I said, he could read a cereal box and I'd be like, that's the best hydrochloric flora flamanidi that I've ever heard of in my entire life. But, but he's, he influenced a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you this morning. Um, and so we do, we come in here, we go, why do you call me Lord, Lord? This is in Matthew chapter seven. Uh, and I'm just going to start in verse 21. And I'm going to go to the end of the chapter. So Matthew chapter seven, starting in verse 21 to the end of the chapter, we read these words, uh, the closing comments of the sermon on the Mount. It says, now everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will, excuse me, excuse me, let me start over. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who bears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. There's a lot of power and truth in those particular words that we've just read. And, and what you see here, again, I already alluded to that right before I started reading. I said, this is the conclusion of what we know to be as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount was, was probably Jesus' most public uh, sermon that he preached. It starts actually in chapter 5. It starts in chapter 5, it goes through chapter 5, it goes through chapter 6, and it ends here in chapter 7. And Jesus is preaching before this large multitude of people. And as he's preaching to them, he is saying things to them that they have never heard before. So like if you're taking notes and you're a listening guide, you, the points this morning are more of just kind of, they're not really points. I mean, the first, the first thing that you can write down in, in, in the blanks is the, the instructions, the instructions. And, and what I mean by saying the instructions is that's actually what the Sermon on the Mount is. In other words, Jesus starts this sermon and, and he starts talking about how to be happy or, or blessed, because that's actually what that word there means. It means happy. So happy are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. You know, that's always a good one. But, but how to be blessed. We call those the Beatitudes. And he's telling us, this is, this is how you live life. And, and there are, we could preach a sermon series on all of those if we wanted to. And for that matter, for this entire thing, we could spend literally months, we could probably spend a year just looking at this particular sermon if we really wanted to dig into the depths of it. But he, but he teaches them how to have a happy or blessed life with these Beatitudes. Then, then he starts to talk about how, how we as believers of him, those who are actually his followers, how we're supposed to be salt and light in this world. 
I mean, we are supposed to be ones, the ones that bring flavor. We're the ones that are supposed to, 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 uh, to, uh, to preserve life even. And we're supposed to bring the one that illuminates that which is in darkness. Because wherever there is light, there can be no darkness. It dispels it. And that is when we, as believers in Christ, when we walk in, our lives ought to be lives that declare, I am a child of the King. There's something different about me, you know? My, my, my words are different. My behavior is different. My interactions are different. I am the light of the world. And I declare in my very being, in my very words, my very actions, the way that I love, I am declaring there is something different about me than the rest of the world. The peace that I have in struggles because I am the light of the world. And these are some of the instructions that he's given to us. He then goes into this section where he elevates the moral law above the law. You, you know, this is this whole section where he says things like, you have heard it said, but I say to you, blah, blah, blah. So, so you've heard it said, um, do not commit murder. But I say to you, if you have hatred in your heart, you have already murdered your brother. Well, that's a pleasant one, isn't it? You know, and, and, he, and he does that with a lot of the law and he elevates it. And he says, you know, you don't understand him. There's a higher standard and the standard is me. And if I'm dwelling within you, it ought to change the way that you live. And you're not performing the rituals of the law for the sake of the law, but you're abiding in me and letting me live the better law out in you, the law of Christ. And in that, as he raises this moral law, he then t tells us how we're supposed to treat people. This is how you're supposed to treat one another. By the way, he's going to bring that up again in a few moments. He's going to do, he has two sections in the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about how we actually treat one another. And they are profound. After he teaches us on how to treat people, he tells us actually how to pray. That what, I mean, if we want to have real power in the Lord God, we got to spend time with him. What is the communication vehicle God has given us to have a, a relationship with him? prayer. It is our chance to talk to him and for him to talk back to us. Most of us, however, have not really learned how to pray and we don't know how to hear the voice of God. And yet he's sitting here saying, this, this, you, if you're going to abide with me, you've got to talk to me and I will talk back. Praise the Lord that he talks back to us. After he tells them how to pray, he then instructs them on, on how to handle their finances and how to be dependent upon him. Because many of us are dependent upon ourselves and our wisdom of finances. And he's sitting there saying, do you, do, you, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And out of that, he starts explaining, you know, you don't need to worry. Seek first the kingdom of God. I know you need all these things. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. And he's talking about needs. He's not talking about necessarily prosperity. He's talking about needs. I know what you need. I know where areas in your life you have lacks and where you are worrying and where you have doubts and where you have fears. Seek me. Seek me. And I'll help you with each of those areas. Finally, he goes into this, this second segment on how to treat people and he emphasizes the golden rule. You know, treat others as you would want them to treat you or how you'd want them to treat you kind of thing. This, this golden rule, he goes into that. Loving your neighbor as yourself. And then finally, he narrows it down and he starts to say, there is a narrow road and a broad road. And those who are of the world and find the broad road, it's easy at the beginning for them. But the more they walk into that broad road that they think is easy, the more it tightens a grip around them before they realize that they are enslaved and snared by the things of this world. But for those who choose the narrow road, the road that is the road of Christ saying, I can't do this. I choose Jesus and Jesus only for my salvation. That road is hard. But the more you spend time with him, the more peace you have, the more joy you have, the more, you know, just understanding you have. And the more you long for the day of redemption, when the worst that your life will ever be is what this life offers and the greatest is in front of you. And this is for those who are truly born again. Those who have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the ones who step on the narrow road. 
And he's sitting there saying, choose the narrow road, choose the narrow road. And then it's out of that, these, after these instructions, it's after these instructions that Jesus then gives on the Sermon on the Mount, the closing words that I've just now read to us. He then begins to say, all right, now you know what I'm teaching you. Now you know what I'm teaching you. And some of you think, hey, I go Lord, Lord all the time, which is why he asked the question. Now, in the Matthew passage, I already indicated, he doesn't say, you know, why do you say Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? He says that in the Luke passage, but it's a still, it's, it's the valuable question that he asks. Because here in the, in the Matthew passage that we look at in verses 21 through 23, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So when he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, you can actually add that the one that comes from, from Luke where he says, why do you say, Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? And then you could add that next part. You know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. So you say, Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. And not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom, which leads us to this second point, which is the question. That is the question. The sermon title is the question. And I'm going to just tell you, beloved, I'm, this, is, this is where I'm... This is, this, is one of the, this is one of these hard kind of messages, okay? Let, let, kind of let me explain. Let me explain. There was a, there was a famous evangelist um, uh, in, the, in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s who went around. And he had a famous sermon, sermon called The Wheat and the Tares. And he would come into churches, and he would preach this sermon, The Wheat and the Tares. And when he got done, he would have saved people thinking they were lost, Okay? And so I come to this passage with, with fear and trepidation because that is the last thing that I want to do. In other words, I don't want to create confusion. In other words, if you really are born again, the Holy Spirit should resonate that reality with you. The Holy Spirit in you should be giving confirmation that you really are His and that you really are born again. The reason why I enter into this particular passage, though, is because of the fact that there are many, many within our churches who are good, faithful church people, and they're moralistically right on target. And the world looks at them and goes, that's a good person. That's a good man. That's a good woman. That's a good, that's a good individual. But they are not really his. And so when I come to a passage like this, this isn't a sermon where I'm going, look at yourself. What I'm doing when I come to a sermon like this is I'm sitting there going, oh, Lord God, examine my heart. Give me and grant me the assurance of my salvation. Help me to know that I really am on the, the narrow path. Give, let your Holy Spirit give the assurance and the unction within me that says, yes, Scott, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes, I have put a new name on your, on your forehead. I have sealed you in the Holy Spirit. And when, when the Holy Spirit does, he gives you peace. That's what he gives. He says, I give peace. I give joy. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I mean, how many times over these last almost 10 years have you heard me say, don't tell me about the day you prayed a prayer? How many times have you heard me say, don't, don't tell me about the day that you got baptized? Don't tell me about the day you walked an aisle. Don't tell me about the day you joined the church. Do you have the peace of God residing in you? Or is your life one that's consumed with worry? Because if you are one who is consumed with worry, the what ifs, I'm, I'm telling you, you need to ask the Father, am I really yours? Because he says, I grant you peace. Now, does that mean that I don't worry? No, there are seasons. Of, I mean, my goodness, y'all, I'm about to take my daughter tomorrow and drop her off in another state and then leave her. You don't think there's worry within my heart about that? There's all kinds of worry. But the question is, is do I let that worry consume me or do I turn it over to the Father? And that's where the issue lies. Who is it I am depending upon for the strength to endure through the challenge? 
That's what I'm talking about. See, so for many of us, we enter into this season of worry, and that's all it is. We are consumed with it. And so we ask the questions over and over again, and we start to try to figure things out on ourselves. You, you're not, I'm just, beloved, you're not smart enough to fix your own problems. Maybe I should speak autobiographically. I'm not smart enough to fix my own problems. The only, yeah, only Jesus can fix our problems. So I come to this passage with, with fear and trepidation because I don't want you to all of a sudden feel a false manipulative kind of thing sitting there going, oh, have you ever worried? Well, then you must not be a believer. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, have you ever? Well, then I don't want you to be, I, you're, you're not saved. At the exact same time, however, I want you to examine your heart. As we look at this, as we look at this question, Lord, 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 you know, who, why do you say to me, Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? And we're going to unpack that just for a few moments. Okay. So within this question, within this question, as I say these words, these words are not, when he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? This is not a contradiction of Romans chapter 10. This is not a contradiction of Romans 10. Romans 10 verse 9 and 10 says these words, that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, uh, as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. This, is, this passage in Matthew is not a contradiction to that. What, what Romans is about is the authentic process of how the we actually enter into the relationship. There is a confessional moment. There is a belief that takes place in the heart. And it is something that the Father author, he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. He initiates it. He brings it to pass. And we respond and say, yes, Lord. Yes. So to say, Lord, Lord, is not a contradiction. Just to say, oh, you know, well, you know why do you say, Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? This is not a contradiction of that passage. It is, it is distinctly possible. This is Alistair Begg. Alistair said this, he said, it is distinctly possible to make a verbal profession, which is unreal, even a particularly striking verbal profession. And I want us to just for a few moments, look at the strikingly public profession that these individuals made regarding Jesus. All right. And this is also in your notes. So again, so these folks here in this Matthew passage, there were several characteristics to their confession. And this is why I'm sitting here saying, beloved, this is really a sermon for us to ask the father genuinely, humbly come before him and say, God, search my heart. Reveal to me, is there, is there, is there really a lordship situation going on? Because these individuals, they were gracious. These individuals who came before the Lord God and he says, I don't know you. These individuals were gracious. Why do I say they were gracious? Because they actually said the word Lord. They actually said the word Lord is an expression of grace and courtesy. That's what it is. It's, that's what, that's, you know, it's, a, it's a thing of honor. Gracious. I recognize that you are so, not me. So they called him Lord. They, they also, these individuals, they were, using a church word, they were orthodox. In other words... They, act, they didn't just say Lord, they said Lord, Lord, and they were indicating that they had some kind of fledgling understanding that this Jesus really was the Messiah. They recognized it, and, it, and this, is, this kind of goes back to like the book of James. In James chapter 2, Jesus, or, uh, James' writing says these things under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, he says you believe God is one? Great. Amen. I'm glad. So happy that you believe God is one. Even the demons believe and they shudder. It is not enough to have intellectual knowledge that Jesus really is the Messiah. That is not saving faith. That is an intellectual knowledge about him. And these individuals here in this passage, they intellectually recognize there's something different about this Jesus. And they're seeing him, beloved. They're actually seeing him. They're watching him do these things. And they're going, there's something different about him. We recognize it. it, it before G Nicodemus actually becomes born again, do we not see that very same concept in John chapter 3? When he comes to him in nighttime, 
secretly trying not to let anybody, none of the he, religious leaders don't know that I'm talking to Jesus, but he says, only one who comes from God can do the things that you do. And we all know it. We all know it. But none of us are accepting it right now. These folks are doing the same thing. They intellectually recognize there's something different about Jesus. So they are orthodox in their belief. They, they were also, this is letter C, they were also enthusiastic. They were enthusiastic. And, and this comes back to the Lord, Lord. They didn't just say Lord. They said, Lord, Lord. They, I mean, they are enthusiastic in their expression towards him. They, they were also public. In other words, the way this is, um, Alistair Bates says, they made it in a way that people around them understood what they were saying. So everybody that hears him say these things, they, they're just like, hey, wait a minute. We know he's Lord. Look, Lord, Lord, look. So they're even, they're even public in it. And then finally, these individuals were dramatic as well. Think about what they did. They actually say, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform miracles in your name? J.D. Greer says it this way when he's talking about this particular passage. He says, when I read that, they're on the A squad. I mean, I, I'm thinking about all those kind of things. Prophesied your name, casting out demons, performing miracles. I, I'm not doing two out of three of those. <laughs> I think they're doing pretty good. And yet, what does Jesus say about these individuals who are also dramatic in their profession of faith? He says, I depart from me. I never knew you, those who practice lawlessness. So false Christ are going to perform miracles. Just understand that. And when I say false Christ, I'm not talking about the Antichrist. I'm talking about false Christ. Those who have the spirit of the Antichrist in them, even right now. False Christ will perform miracles. And don't think that giftedness equals an understanding of lordship. Don't think that just because a man is a tremendous preacher that he is living under the lordship of Christ. This, this comes back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 and 10 Paul, writing to the church of Thessalonica, says, That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of the wickedness for those who perish, because they do not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So Paul says, look, there's going to be this time coming when the spirits of this Antichrist are in the world, and they're going to do things that are going to make them look like they actually are believers of God, and they are not. And they are not. They actually practice lawlessness. And beloved, and again, I'm not, I'm not, this is, again, beloved, I'm telling this with all humility, I'm, as best I can. I am not condemning any individuals because I do not have a machine that I can stick over, the, over your heart and go, oh, I see Jesus there. How many times have you heard me say that? I cannot do that. I don't have that capacity. But beloved, why do you think we have so many mega pastors who all of a sudden find themselves in infidelity. And I'm not saying that they're lost, okay? Don't hear me say that they're lost. But it certainly does make me ask the question, are they really his? Now, I can't, I'm not, I don't get the, the position. I don't get the, the, the right to stand in that seat of judgment. And when we are talking about the instructions, I don't get the right to say that. But I certainly get to evaluate the fruit and go, something isn't matching. Because for many of these individuals, they lived decades like this, hiding it from the public. And then all of a sudden it comes out. And, and yet they were doing godly work. Do you understand? This, this, and this is why we don't, we don't go and we don't, go, we don't do this. That's not what we're doing. What we do is this. We can turn it, turn it back and say, oh God, God, help, help, help me to walk with you. Help me to abide with you. Help me to experience this grace with you. Help me to walk in you. You, you put this hedge of protection around me. Help, help me to be like Job and make a covenant with my eyes. Help, help me to walk faithfully with you. You be my strength. You be my all in all. You be my sufficiency. You be the one that I turn to and run to. This is the heartbeat of what we're needed to do when we read a passage like this. Examine yourself. Don't start pointing fingers at people and going, boy, I sure wish they were here to hear this. 
Don't do that. Don't do that. Ask the Lord God to examine your own heart just like David did. Okay? Let me, let me read another section from Alistair Begg. Alistair Begg said it this way. He says, it is for this reason that the emphasis of the Bible for both the individual in examining our life before God and in assessing the effectiveness and the import of ministry as it is exercised by others is directly related to the holiness of our lives and the obedience of our hearts and not to the apparent exceptional nature of our gifts. John Stott said it this way. He says, John Stott calls this talk without truth, profession without reality. So in other words, are you professing Christ without any reality in the heart? That's what John Stott's saying. Oh my goodness. Coming back to beg, the real evidence of conversion is that they depart from iniquity. It is not that they live lives, uh, perfect lives, but rather it is that when they are confronted by the peculiar clutches of the demands that are made upon them, that they say, oh no. And the reason is because of the demands of the Lordship of Christ. Alistair Begg is right on target. So, so he goes through this, helping us understand we, we're needing to, to hold these things in contrast. And that leads then, he says, let me give you, this is Jesus. Let me give you an illustration which is your third point. So he's given us the instructions of the Sermon on the Mount. He then gives us this question. And then he says, let me give an illustration of this. And so let's read the illustration. This is verses 24 through 27. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now, you all have, you know, we, we if even earlier this summer, I used an illustration and we came to the understanding that Ronnie Durrance and I are not the ones you want to call for home repair. Okay. Right, Ronnie? We, we, we have issues. We get, it, we, we get it done, though. We get it done. We both got our, our assignment done. It didn't look right, but we got ours done. <laughs> right? But, so you don't call us, all right? You, 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 you call other people. You call Bill Abernath. You call, you call uh, Jack. You call Bobby. You call other people. Don't call us. Okay? But he, so here's, here's why I say this to say this, this part with this, Okay? I can't tell you if something's being built properly or not. <laughs> what I do know is I have driven by construction sites and there's some construction sites that I'm sitting there going, are they ever going to build that thing? I, I mean, it, they, they've been in the ground a really, really, really long time. <laughs> okay. And there's other sites you go by and it's like they were in the ground for like a week and all of a sudden there's a whole house there. Okay. And that's what this is all about. That's what this illustration is all about. You can't tell. It is impossible to tell by what the result of the construction looks like. In other words, both look like they're good houses. Both have the same kind of you know, materials used. Both, both have pretty color paint on them. The lawns are all nice and, 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 and neat. You look at them both and you're going, they look like the same house. But when the storm comes, you find out who actually spent more time underground. Because it's in the underground work that the foundation is established. And is our foundation, is our foundation the cornerstone who is Christ Jesus? Or do we have a foundation based on the fluff of the world? and our own self. Because if our foundation is just us, we will crumble. We will fall. We will not make it. We will spend eternity in the lake of fire separated from the love of God, and he will say, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Let us let us make certain, this is the whole point, let us examine our heart. 
So what I'm saying is, is in this, he's, he's doing these contrasts. When he gave the, the question, he was contrasting what they were saying. They were saying, Lord, Lord, but they are doing, they were saying and doing. But here he's, he's having them contrast, you hear and you do. Again, I don't want this to be a do better sermon because your do betterism isn't going to save you. Just doing better, being a better church member isn't going to save you. But at the exact same time, it ought to be something that you can use like as a barometer to tell what kind of pressure is in the room within your life. Does your life bear the evidence of Christ in you, the hope of your glory? Which is then where we bring this all to an application. That's your last thing. So we have the instructions, we have the question, we have the illustration, and let's bring it all home with some application. And here's where I'm going to spend a lot of time with Alistair Begg. You can't tell you looking at me, me looking at you, we all look good. I mean, and we're here on a Sunday. I mean, is there not some beach we could all go to? Is there not some fishing hole we could get to? Or people like me, is there not some golf course I could go play on right now? We all are here. We all look like we're believers. So here's the application. Going to Alistair Begg. Gather, these are words of Alistair. Gathering with the Jesus crowd. Being able to say all the Jesus words. Singing all the Jesus songs is no ticket of admission to heaven. The reason I'm quoting Alistair Begg is because I want you all to know I'm not the one saying these things. <laughs> but he's right on target. He's right on target. So gathering with Jesus, the Jesus crowd, being able to say all the Jesus words, singing all the Jesus songs is no ticket of admission to heaven. It would be better off for some of you not to be here at all, in a sense, that you would, be, would, not, uh, words, that you would not living um, with a strange and forlorn idea that because you are attending a Jesus event and listening to Jesus' stories and singing Jesus' words that somehow or another that you are actually living under his lordship. It would be better if you were down the street with no interest at all and you came to the awareness and the emptiness of it all that you never used his name or sang one of his songs and you discovered in all of that lostness that you need to go and find Jesus. But when you come in here, it's real dangerous because you are singing the Jesus songs and you are listening to the Jesus words and you're doing these things. So, so for us, it's real dangerous. The danger is that you look at the building of the professing Christians and the actual Christians, and you can't tell the difference between them at all. So all of the superficial judging that Jesus has been giving instruction about in the previous two chapters is unhelpful. God is the only one who can determine the genuine Christian article from the imposter. The issue is not whether we hear it or even believe it or affirm it, but rather that we do it. Is there life change in you? Is there life change in you? We baptize on a profession of faith. But are there foundations? We baptize on a profession of faith, but are there foundations? Beloved, the reason we're in the book of Ephesians is because we said, how do we live out this Christian life? All of last year was about breakthrough. And I said, go, how do we live life of breakthrough? And the only way we live this life of breakthrough is by abiding with the Lord God. And I think Ephesians is one of the best books that gives us that picture. And so before we jump back into it, I'm wanting us to take just a moment right now during this time of invitation for us to sit here and go, God, examine my heart. Am I really yours? Is there really life change in me? Or do I just look the part? Do I look the part? Because if all you do is look the part and you do not have a relationship with the king, then he will say, depart from me, you who practice 
lawlessness. Again, I'm not preaching this to make you question your salvation. If you're born again, the Holy Spirit will give confirmation to that. But if you're over here simply going, man, I just don't know. Then today is the day. Today is the day for you to make it right with the Father. All you got to do is cry out and say, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. And really, truly mean it, not intellectually, but relationally. And, and asking him, Lord Jesus, come and live within my heart and become Lord of my life. And you're going to understand lordship because when he pricks your heart, you're going to sit there and go, I want to say yes. I want to obey. It doesn't, it, that does not mean that you're going to do it perfectly. That does not mean that you're going to do it without fear. Oh my goodness, the fear that we experience when we share the gospel, at least when I share the gospel, maybe you're different, but when I share the gospel, everything with inside of me says, but what if they reject me or say no? It's not about your feelings. It's about the life change of Christ in you. That when he then speaks, even when you're afraid, even when you don't want to do it, you don't choose your way. You say, yes, Lord. And you walk in obedience with him. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? If that is the pattern of your life, if that is the pattern of your life, you've got to ask yourself, am I really his? Am I really his? I'm not talking about the occasional time. Because look, there's even times Jesus tells me to talk to somebody. And I go, uh -uh, no, sir. So I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about the overarching pattern of your life. Like, like high 90 percentile pattern of your life. Are you one who surrenders to the lordship of Christ? Or do you say, I'm going to live life my way. On my agenda on my wants, on my desires, on what I want to see happen. If that's you, you've got to really ask yourself, am I really his? And then we're going to give you an opportunity during this time of invitation for you to respond and say, Jesus, save me. Make me truly yours. Father, I thank you for your words. I thank you for your, this, this, this passage of scripture that, Father, always, it is so hard for me to preach this. And in fact, Lord, as I actually go back and I looked at my records, this is the first time I've ever passed, preached this passage in our church in a service. We did, I did preach it one time during a funeral, and it was an easy funeral to preach that one for. But it's the first time in this pulpit that I've actually preached this passage because, Father, it's a passage that makes me always come back and ask the question, Lord, am I saying yes? It is, a, is it indicative of my life to where I sit here and I lay down in brokenness before you? And that I humble myself before you and say, yes, Lord, yes, to your will, to your way, to your provision, to your grace. Father, may we as First Baptist Church of Bowling Green because I'm so in love with you that we abide with you so much that the natural outflow is obedience. Not obedience for the sake of confirmation of our salvation that we can point to people and say, oh, look, did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not do miracles in your name? Not like that. Not like that. But that it's just this natural, oh my goodness, I get this opportunity because I have been saved. And he gave it all for me. I want to give it all for him. All of who I am, I surrender to you. Oh, Lord Jesus, may that be the heartbeat of us here this morning. And Lord, if there's anyone here in this room that has been pricked by your spirit, let them come forward even now. Let them get it right with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.